Today, I'm going to be talking to you about the new treatments that we are developing for Alzheimer's. We're also gonna talk about some of the treatments we're developing for other brain diseases. Before I start with the slides, um, I just wanna give a, a, a little teeny introduction. Uh, we do know that we're living a lot longer today than ever before. In 1900, the average lifespan for a woman in this country was 50 years of age. Men didn't even live that long. So obviously there were not very many people in, 19, in, in 1900 who got Alzheimer's disease because this is a disease uh, of aging associated with aging. It's not a natural part of aging, but when, the older we get, uh, the less our bodies are able to maintain the hormonal support uh, that we need. We know that levels of things like testosterone and estrogen go down, levels of prolactin go down. Um, sometimes there's not enough insulin and insulin signaling and we get adult onset diabetes. So there's a lot of changes that are occurring which we're seeing the effect of today because we are living longer. Um, you see the title of my talk is about intranasal insulin drugs and stem cells these are adult stem cells taken from human adults or adult animals if we're doing animal studies, that these can get around the blood-brain barrier to treat a lot of these brain diseases that I've been talking about. And so that's what we're going to talk about now. Many years ago when I was working on Alzheimer's disease and I had certain therapeutic agents, things like uh, growth factors and hormones that I wanted to use, I realized how, what a big problem this was. And I actually managed to come up with a solution to this problem. I'd like to say I sat down and I just thought through it and figured it out, but that's not what happened. I actually had a dream and the idea came to me when I was asleep in a dream. So I'm not gonna take a lot of credit for you know intellectually working this out. But in my dream, it was just this simple idea of you know, giving hormones and growth factors to the brain. And they were in the dream saying, no, it'll never work. And I simply thought, you know, it would work if we could find a way to get them in around this barrier. And suddenly I got this idea of giving them intranasally. Now, why did I get that idea in this dream? Well, because we've known since about 1902 or three that all kinds of things that are harmful can get into your brain if they get into the roof of your nasal cavity. So we know that certain um, toxins in the environment that you inhale in your nose, that get up high in your nose, can travel up the nerves involved in smell straight into your brain. We know that people who swim in polluted water in, uh, in uh, Arizona or um, other in Africa can sometimes get that polluted water in their nose and the amoebas in that water can actually travel up along those nerves involved in smell into the brain and kill them. The glaria infection of the brain, the canthamoeba infection of the brain. We know that viruses that get into the nose sometimes travel along the nerves involved in smell into the brain. It just hit me in the dream, if bad things can do it, why can't good things do it? And immediately when I woke up, I. Uh, wrote a patent application. I was so convinced it would work. And then we did the experiments and showed that it would. So before this, people had tried very invasive methods of getting things into the brain. They would bore a hole in the skull and they would put the drug right into the brain tissue. Well, that damages the brain when you're doing that. They would try to put it in the cerebrospinal fluid that bathes the brain. Guess what? It's in the cerebrospinal fluid, but that doesn't mean it's in the brain where you want it. How is it going to cross the ependymal lining of the ventricles and get into the brain? They had tried uh, many kinds of things that, that didn't really work. And so when I focused then uh, was on this nasal delivery, the idea that we could put drugs in the nose and they could follow the nerves involved in smell up into the brain and help to treat brain disease. And this is a little schematic of the roof of the nasal cavity. And here we have the skull that separates the brain from the nasal cavity. And there are little holes or foramina here. And the nerves involved in smell uh, 
come to the, into the uh, nasal mucosa so that when we and bring s molecules of a, of a perfume or whatever into the nose, they can bind to the uh, sensory receptors for smell and send a signal. But the exciting thing is that it turns out that drugs that reach this part of the nose can simply follow the nerve axon bundles right up into the brain through these holes in the skull. Now, this Alzheimer's is completely non-invasive. A lot of scientists friends. don't know, including some in the Alzheimer field don't seem to know, is that people who have Alzheimer's accumulate iron in the brain abnormally. Of course, we all need iron. Iron is involved in our hemoglobin that carries the oxygen around the body. And so this is not about how much iron you're ingesting. It has to do with the way the brain is handling iron. But it turns out that not just in Alzheimer's, but in almost every neurodegenerative disease, iron accumulates abnormally in the brain. And we can see the iron now by MRI, a special type of MRI. And we know that iron causes the formation of free radicals that damage the brain, o oxidative damage to the brain. And we've reported that in particular, the memory receptor in the brain is inactivated by free radicals caused by iron that, uh, of the type that accumulates in Alzheimer's. So this is a serious aspect of this complicated disease. Fortunately, for 40 years or so, we have had a drug called deferoxamine that binds iron with extremely high affinity. Uh, 10 to the sixth power is a million. 10 to the ninth is a uh, billion, 10 to the 12th is a trillion. This thing binds iron, this drug, at 10 to the 31st power. It's a crazy high affinity for iron. If there's any iron around, bingo, it grabs it. And when it grabs it, then the iron no longer is causing damage. And this is a drug that's been used to treat people who have too much iron in their bloodstream. And now we're wanting to use it to treat people who have brain diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, Huntington's, things like that. Now, many years ago, Alzheimer patients were treated in a clinical trial with this drug, and it was given intramuscularly. This drug does not cross the blood-brain barrier very well, but in spite of that, the Alzheimer patients who got the drug once a day intramuscularly by injection actually found, it was found that it reduced their cognitive decline, their memory loss, by 50% over a period of two years. That's a huge benefit. More benefit than Aricept, more benefit than Namenda, or, or anything on the market today. But unfortunately, there were side effects when this was done. So we are looking to develop this now as an intranasal treatment, where we target it straight into the brain, we get it to the brain more effectively, and we don't have to deliver it to all the other organs in the body. This same drug has been shown in many studies in animals to be very effective for protecting the brain against head injury, against hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage, intracerebral hemorrhage, spinal cord injury. So again, this drug has many great potential if we can deliver it into the brains of humans intranasally and not have all these side effects that occur otherwise. Now, once we tried the intranasal insulin in normal mice, we found, um, oh, oh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. We tried this in animals with stroke, rats with stroke, and we found that it reduced their brain damage by 55%. Just a few nose drops. We could, give, we could either give it on a Friday, and then they would have the stroke on Monday, and they would be protected, or we could give it after they had the stroke. When we give it to normal mice that have nothing wrong with them at all, it improves their memory. We end up with mice that are smarter than mice that didn't get it. When we uh, give it intranasally to mice that have Alzheimer's, this is a genetically altered mouse that you know, has something close to Alzheimer's, it reduces their memory loss. And it, we know that it can protect the brain and reduce the formation of Alzheimer tangles. Now, the National Institute of Aging saw what we had done with this, and they have tried to help us, and they put up a million dollars to have the intranasal treatment 
uh, tested for safety um, in, in uh, animals so that it could then be go into humans. And so far, uh, it looks to be safe. In fact, there was a study done a very long time ago with intranasal deferoxamine, not for the idea of getting it into the brain, but more because they wanted to uh, get it into the blood. <coughs> and when they did this, they didn't really see any significant side effects. So we think that this is going to be a treatment that could potentially uh, be used in humans. It appears to be safe so far and could be very beneficial. Um, since this slide was made, we've also shown that this is, is very effective at treating animals with Parkinson's as well. So let's now talk about Alzheimer's in human studies. One of the things that's very interesting about Alzheimer's disease, again, something that was not really appreciated for many, many years, is that if you do a PET scan, it's a kind of brain scan that assesses the uptake of blood sugar into the brain. The brain cells need blood sugar or glucose for energy. It's really the only source of energy our brain cells normally use. And when we do a PET scan, and this was done at New York University by a, a, a really good researcher, Moni de Leon, uh, when we do a PET scan of normal elderly humans, it looks like this one over here. What we see is there's a lot of uptake of glucose or blood sugar into the brain. The brain is using that and making energy, okay, for brain cells. And what does it use the energy for? Well, to replace parts of the cells that might wear out, to help you think and remember and do everything that your brain basically has to do. Surprisingly, when they scanned Alzheimer patients' brain, they found there was very little uptake and utilization of glucose. We know now, from work done by a woman researcher, Suzanne Delamonte and others, that both the amount of insulin and insulin signaling is decreased in the brains of patients with Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, she and a fellow named Hoyer have called Alzheimer's disease type 3 diabetes, or diabetes of the brain because there's not enough insulin signaling, the brain's not taking up enough glucose, and that leaves the brain cells starved for energy and unable to function normally. The first trial which I did with uh, Dr. Kraft, who's at University of Seattle in Washington, and a number of physicians there, uh, including Dr. Rieger, showed that if we simply took insulin and we used nose drops in the first study, and we gave either nose drops of insulin or placebo to Alzheimer patients only, only one time. And 15 minutes later, we assessed their memory. How, could, how well could they remember a list of words after a delay? How well could they remember the content of a short little story we would read to them after a delay? We found it actually improved their memory. Just one, one single treatment. Then Dr. Kraft did a three-week treatment where she actually used a nasal spray device and gave the insulin to them twice a day. Why did she do it twice a day? Well, with regular diabetes, usually people inject insulin in the morning and the evening. It's twice a day normally. So she thought, let's do this twice a day. And in fact, it, it improved their memory, it improved their attention, and improve their functional status or ability to function in these Alzheimer patients. Now, not all Alzheimer patients are the same. Some, of, some people get Alzheimer's very early. They might get it when they're 50, let's say. None of those patients, none of the early onset cases were tested yet with intranasal insulin. So we don't know if it will help them or it won't help them. These are only people who were over 60. Uh, and we need additional trials before the FDA will decide are they going to approve this treatment or not. Fortunately, after um, many, many years, since it was 2001 when the patent issued on this treatment, fortunately now in 2014, the federal government finally decided to put up $7.9 million to actually test this treatment further. So in their federally funded centers that are around the country, uh, there will be more phase two clinical trials uh, in patients starting this year. So we're very excited that that's happening.
Okay, with the insulin, with the intranasal insulin, okay. Um, it doesn't, it, it, isn't a, uh, it isn't like you just take it and now your memory is improving enough to take it again. It's sort of like with diabetics. If you have a person who's diabetic and they need insulin, what happens to them if we just say, okay, you're diabetic, you're not taking up glucose normally, but we're just not going to give you any insulin? Well, all kinds of things in their body are going to deteriorate and they're going to die from diabetes, okay? This is sort of similar. Just like the diabetics have to take it twice a day for the rest of their life, if the brain isn't getting enough insulin, as far as we know right now, you may need to spray it in your nose twice a day. So the benefit is maintaining the signaling in the brain so the brain has the energy it needs. Again, this is not an approved treatment yet, this, but it looks more promising than any of the other treatments that are out there right now. The question is, how would you know if your brain isn't getting enough insulin signaling? And the answer is, you won't know unless someone does a, a, a glucose PET scan, what's called a fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan, you won't really know. And right now, that's not the standard of care to just carry out you know, these PET scans on people willy-nilly because PET scans are expensive. And, um, you know, it hasn't been absolutely proven to the satisfaction of the medical community that even if you saw something that you would necessarily know what to do to improve that patient. So that's where we need to go, in my opinion. But, but right now, you probably won't know if that's going on. Her question is, is there something the American public can do to move things forward? So the first thing I would recommend is donate to research on Alzheimer's disease and look into, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to give the money to us. There are other research centers. If you want to give it to them, do. Uh, but look into where your money is going and just make sure it's actually going for the purpose that you want. That's the first thing. The second thing is I do think we can elect people because it's the, the House of Representatives and the Senate that in the end determine how our money is spent. Oh. We can write letters to them and we can talk to them when they're running for office and let them know that we are very concerned about health care and about Alzheimer's, which is a really scary thing when you think about all the people in my generation, the baby boomers, that are coming into the age of risk here.